On today's show, we speak with arts educator Melissa Kowal on a new open here and talk about upcoming things to do in our South Shore towns. You can get the bad news in lots of places. On the local scene, it's all about what's good and good to know. I'm Elizabeth. Let's get started. Located in the heart of downtown Plymouth and site of the Mayflower Pilgrim's Fort, Burial Hill is an historic cemetery containing more than 2,000 marked graves, many dating back to the 17th century and of the founding settlers of Plymouth. This spring, the Plymouth Antiquarian Society and Pilgrim Hall Museum are once again partnering for guided tours of Burial Hill on the first Saturdays of the month through November. On April 1st at 1 p.m., join Dr. Ann Mason for Democracy in Action, Plymouth's town meeting. The tour will last approximately one hour, and you'll want to wear comfortable shoes appropriate for navigating steep and grassy slopes. Tours begin at the top of the hill, are open to the public, and free. For more information and updates in case of inclement weather, visit the Antiquarian Society and Pilgrim Hall Museum's Facebook pages. Melissa Kowal is an arts educator well known for the fun program she runs for the Kingston Public Library and Recreation Departments and as the owner of Beeble Art Center. Tiff Phillips sat down with Melissa to learn more. Okay, we're here with Melissa Kowal, owner of Beeble Art Center. So excited to have you. Oh, thanks for having me on. So I want to get right into it. Can you tell us a little bit about your background, where you grew up? Well, we were just talking about it off camera. <laughs> but I am not from Kingston, and I'm not from Plymouth. Despite I'm not popular normally, belief. I know everybody thinks that I miss Kingston, but I'm not. I grew up in a place called Belchertown, Massachusetts. You are allowed to laugh. It is literally Belcher town, <laughs> like a burp town, but it's classy and fantastic. Um, is it over in Western Mass? So I grew up like on a mountain, well, on a hill. People will be able to that. <laughs> up, but, um, like surrounded by woods and nature and color, and it's right near a whole bunch of colleges. Like UMass Amherst is like 15, 20 minutes away. So I was like always around a whole bunch of like color and nature. I know, it's a beautiful area. I went to school out there. We had just talked about that a little yeah. while ago. It's such a gorgeous area. It makes you, you need like a passport. It's such a different area than Eastern Mass. Absolutely. There's so, waterfalls there. We don't have waterfalls here. I know, here. and mountains, I mean hills. Yeah. More um, animals and less pigeons. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> Love pigeons, though. Uh, seriously. So how did you get here? Um, so I went to Kingston Elementary School to go be their art teacher, and it was a part-time gig, which is fantastic, but I needed more of a full-time situation. So I was there for, like, an incredible, beautiful three years, and I loved it, and I fell in love with Kingston. I started um, living in Kingston for, like, three and a half years, right next to, we were talking about this too, like the trifecta of I lived across the street from the recreation center, I lived next to the library, I lived near the Adams Center, and I just kind of, like, fell in love with Kingston mm -hmm. all, all at once. It was so wonderful. And being able to be a part of that community with the elementary school, which is the best elementary school I've ever gotten the privilege to work with. Wow. And I've worked with quite a few of them by yeah. now. <laughs> oh, wow. So you just became a Kingstonian. Is that what you call them? I think so. <laughs> sure. Yeah. We'll go with Let's it. Let's do it. <laughs> Did you always know you were going to be an artist? Was it in your blood or is it something you kind of just stumbled into? Um, I was kind of told that I was going to be an artist by, um, I call her my meme, but she was my grandmother, mm -hmm. my mom's mother, who unfortunately is not around anymore. But she always had a bunch of art supplies out and she basically like, we were over there like three days a week for like nine, ten hours because that's what daycare used to be right. before it was like millions of dollars to get <laughs> daycare. <laughs> so she would have art supplies out and she started kind of noticing that I really loved it. And then my other grandmother got into it because, you know, they talk. Uh, and then I just started to fall in love with color and being able to paint and making things that weren't there before. I really loved popsicle sticks and making little communities. So then now I'm just making communities through art but with real people. <laughs> That's a great way of looking at yeah. it. <laughs> but still with some popsicle sticks mixed in there. Right. <laughs> I mean, life would not go without popsicle sticks. I mean, yeah. you got to remember at a young age building a popsicle, you know, yeah. birdhouse. <laughs> Having to eat all the popsicles. Oh, 
But you had to eat them with the jokes on them, clearly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's probably where I get my horrible jokes from. <laughs> You get both, the, the art and the jokes. The more horrible, the better. I love it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so how did you get into teaching? Did you go to school for that? Oh, yeah. Um, I actually shadowed my art teacher when I was in high school, and it was totally like a fluke. We had a, an amazing biology teacher named Mr. Monroe. Oh, I loved him. He was one of my favorite teachers. One of them. Not my favorite. <laughs> um And he wanted us all to do job shadows to figure out, okay, what do you want to be when you grow up? You don't need to know now, but you need to know what you don't want to be. And I was like, okay, I think that I kind of, I love art and I love teaching and I love people. So I'm going to go shadow um, Miss St. Pierre. So I went and go shadow in her room and I like just absolutely fell in love with being able to show people how to make things and then they go and make something different being able to show the pinch pot, and she was a ceramicist, so she went in and just actually worked with the clay and showed me how to wedge things, and I was like, oh, okay, I want to be with you when I grow up. And um, Miss Texera was also a huge, she was one of those art teachers that, I don't know if you've ever had this, but she like started with us in elementary school, and then there was an opening job at the middle school, so then she went there, and then there was an opening job at the high school, so she went there. So I was like, oh, she's the coolest person I've ever (laughs) seen in my whole life so I was like okay I want to be both of you when I grow up and done so then I went to school to be in art education isn't it amazing how teachers can just do that just change your whole world around I mean I think we take for granted how much of an impact they have on our lives for sure I don't think kids do I think kids know that oh this is where I'm going to start my education and you are my role model and I'm going to know you forever that's what I've seen with my students they don't forget you oh I love that I mean you don't forget the good ones for sure for sure (laughs) I mean I'm not going there but yeah (laughs) so people art center how did that evolve Oh, it came out of uh, COVID, much like everything around us now. Fair. Um, I always kind of knew that I wanted to develop my own brand of something. Even when I was younger, I've always wanted to do like something entrepreneurial. And I wanted to figure out how to be an art teacher, but also how to kind of dive into something that wasn't um, public school. Because in public school, you have the kids for either 30 minutes to 45 minutes. Sometimes if you're really lucky, you get them two hours, maybe once a week to twice a week. I used to be um, a high school teacher at East Bridgewater. I was like, okay, I love all of these age groups from kindergarten to when you're 99 years old. How can I work with all of them all at once and still develop art with them and still be a teacher, but maybe just outside of the school system? And then my lovely husband, Dan Duggan, said, okay, just do it. Just, like, make your own company. And I was like, no, that, that's not possible. You can't just, like, do that. And he was like, why not? I, oh, you can just, like, stop teaching? What do you mean? <laughs> I can just, like, not have a job for, like, a yeah. second? And he's like, yeah, it's the summer. Yeah. You're just making your curriculum anyway. Just do it outside of the classroom. And I was like, oh, you're very smart, sir. That's why I picked you to marry <laughs> You know, that should be everybody's motto. Why not? Yeah, exactly. Especially during the pandemic. It's like, you're just going to have to pivot. Why not? Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> Especially because I think that we were all so confined and being like, okay, no, this is not a part of the dream life. I'm going to make my dream life. I was just talking to a friend of mine, Cassie Watt, and I'm being like, if you have the opportunity to create the life that you want to live, you better do it. You're only living and you're only going to be this person once. And I'm only going to be able to do this job for as long as I'm able to, hopefully for the next 50 years, but who knows? And it's working, which is even more incredible. (laughs) It could have not worked. Right. (laughs) But it did. I mean, because you you just have to take the plunge sometimes. Where did the name come from? (laughs) So Beeple is my childhood nickname. Oh. My mom and my dad used to call me Bee Honeybee because I would just like buzz around and just, she's just a little bee. She's just this little like the thing that has a stinger and she can be very sweet. <laughs> um, and then my dad started calling me Beeble, kind of like, you know how you have a dog or a cat and you're like, that is not the name that you chose. <laughs> like, I have a cat named Mac. His real name's Macaroni. Does he know that name? Absolutely not. <laughs> but he started calling me Beeble and then I was like, okay, what if I had like a children's line of something called Beeble that's really cute or like a an antique store named Beeble or something. And then eventually when Dan told me to do this this company and I was like oh I can't call it anything but Beeble Art LLC 
It's perfect. I love that. And it's yeah. such a cute name. And I bet do people, everyone is like, what is right? it? <laughs> That's what I'm going to ask you. Does everybody ask you, like, where did that yes, come from? Absolutely. Or they don't know how to say it. They're like, the blah, blah, blah. Right. <laughs> yeah, whatever, you know, your little company thing. <laughs> <laughs> how do you feel like you've changed since you started? Uh, what what is How has it evolved over time? Oh, I can finally understand what I need to buy. And what I don't need to buy. Fair. <laughs> At the first part, it's art supplies. It's the most fun thing to buy in the world. You buy it all. You just keep going. And then you're like, oh, OK. So I normally just do like clay and painting and drawing. I don't need pom-poms or glitter. <laughs> I just don't need those things. I would mistakenly just buy like $300 worth of Lisa Frank stickers. Just, you know. <laughs> there. Those coupons. You just get whatever you get. <laughs> So why teach? Why, why? What does it do for you? How does it make you thrive? Like, how, does, how do you feel when you teach? Mm. It's the first connection that we kind of have in this world is being taught something, whether it's by your parent or guardian or sister or brother or somebody in your community. It's the first connection. And that connection that you have to another person when you're teaching them something new is, like, completely like none other. Being like, okay... It's, it's the teach the person to fish narrative, right? You right. Know, you can give them the fish. You can give them the art. And they will have it. And they'll be like, great. And then when they move, they might leave it behind. But if you teach them how to make the art and they leave that thing behind, they could fill an entire museum with what you taught them. And that's the connection that I really like. What do you hope students take away from your classes? Just a joy of creating something. They might not have the best um, dexterity. They might not know how to mix colors perfectly to get a skin tone, but the fact that they want to do it after they leave my class is the best element that I could ever teach anybody. What about your own art? Do you have a particular style or medium? You, you like a lot of color. I know that, <laughs> which is great. Vibrancy. <laughs> um, probably just Vibrancy, and I love to do a lot of things with clay mm. and textural designs. So I think color and texture, I'm just so fascinated by, especially with plants. They're so natural in everything that they produce, and plants are so vibrant, and the fact that they have that like texture, like this table has texture, and it's from a natural wood-ish. Um, <laughs> Seeing that in nature inspires me so much that I love to like reproduce it in either my ceramics or into my paintings. It's so funny that you say texture because when we first met you, we met you at the Kingston Mural. Yeah. We did a piece on that with Sue Woodward from mm -hmm. Kingston Recreation. And I remember there are textures on the wall, yeah. like a sensory thing. And that's so amazing. So like that's really a part of, of your, your medium. Mm -hmm. that's, that's fantastic. I love that wall, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> with my art, I feel like it's really important no matter who you are, you can experience mm. it. So even if you do have something wrong with your vision or if you have something going on um, with your senses, maybe you get really overwhelmed, you can break it away and actually get something out of the art that I hopefully produce and that I teach, depending on whoever your skill set or whatever you have going on. Do you have any particular artists that inspire you and in, like your teaching? Oh, all of them, but I forgot <laughs> all of them now. Um, since it is Women's History Month right oh, now. I don't go. know when this is coming out, but hopefully <laughs> right now. Frida Kahlo, that's like such a trope, but she's incredible, the fact that she went through so much and she still produced and just like put her entire self into her paintings. And they're so, they're about her life. And yeah, she's just, I love learning about her. And through her, you can find so many other artists that she got taught through right. and through her society of like all the surrealist artists you can kind of like spin a narrative of all art history right and, and it's interesting with Frida Kahlo because she she has such a, a great sense of herself mm -hmm. through her art like yeah, she has a style of her own that no one else can make yeah she was way beyond her time for sure yeah, and she wore pants I, exactly <laughs> <laughs> just fighting the system yeah and suits and stuff <laughs> How would you describe your outlook on life? You seem to be like a very optimistic person. Is that true? Oh, um, I think that there is so much going on in the world that you have to try your best to be the good in it. Be the good. You're not going to be always. Sometimes I'm very grumpy. Sometimes I'm very sad. Sometimes I just like collapse on the floor and my cats see if I'm dead, you know. But you have to find something 
that is the good in your day or the good that happened. I even have a little plaque that I made at um, East Bridgewater, and it sits above um, my doorway that when you walk through the doorway, it says, be the good. And Mm. you just have to feel that even if you don't want to. (laughs) (laughs) What does a typical day look like for you? Are you kind of all over the place? It really depends, right? Yeah. Um, it depends on if I have a morning class or if I'm going to the gallery or if I'm going to the Kingston Recreation Art Studio or if I'm going to somebody's house or a birthday party. But normally I have like what's called a slow morning. Definitely look it up if you don't know it. <laughs> but you wake up, you allow yourself to breathe, actually be in silence with your coffee, maybe you look out into nature. I do think that you should like get just a face full of sunlight if you can, if not, Just look outside, look at a bird. Eat if you're hungry, and only if you're hungry. Um, Not don't eat if you're not hungry, (laughs) but like, you know, try to feel yourself out. What are your needs? Do you need a glass of water? And then I start absolutely chaos, (laughs) running around. Where am I going for the day? Okay, email, 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 and then go. I try to only check my email once or twice a day. It doesn't work. But then I normally go to my gallery in Pembroke. Um, it's a charity gallery with End Hunger, New England, and it's an incredible place, so definitely go check that out. And then that's normally where I spend, like, mornings, and then I have lunch break, which is about an hour long, so that's important. Mm-hmm. An hour-long lunch, very important. And then I go to Kingston Recreation until, like, 7, 7.30. Have you learned to, like, embrace the chaos, so to speak? I've always embraced the chaos. (laughs) I've never had a routine in my entire life. (laughs) I love High energy is good. I love it. Yeah. So what do you think think the future has in store for you and for Bebel Arts Center? Oh, that's so hard to say. I feel like I'm a little bit just, like, trying to figure it out as I go. I would love to eventually have a brick-and-mortar building of Bebel Arts Center and make it, like, a community hub of, like, yoga teachers, spiritual healing, um, other artists that can, like, be in a display of the gallery wall. But I kind of already have that in my gallery in um, Pembroke and at the Kingston Recreation. Um, I'm just doing a workshop with Tori Best. She's an incredible yoga teacher, and we're going to be doing some um, artistic alignment and yoga all together. It'll be really cool. Do you have it for adults? Yeah, it is for adults. It is for adults. Yeah, 16 and up. Uh, all right, so looking up. That on the website. It's coming up in June. Um, but doing something like that, but having having just one place for it. Right now I'm kind of like all over the place running around, but I would like to eventually have a routine. Maybe, but who knows? <laughs> if it's in the cards. <laughs> yeah. Melissa Kual, thank you so much. Such a joy. I hope we do a lot more future collaborations together. Oh, we will, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Oh, thank you for having me. Visit BeebleArt.Center to check out more from Melissa Kual. On Sunday, April 2nd at 2 p.m., head over to the Merry Room at the Duxbury Free Library for their Sunday Arts and Culture series. Ethan Robbins and Ariel Bernstein make up cold chocolate, an Americana band that uses vocals, percussion, and guitar to blend elements of folk, funk, and bluegrass to create their own unique sound. This genre-bending Boston band plays music festivals and venues across the country. But thanks to full funding by the Friends of the Duxbury Free Library, you get to see this high-energy band for free. Registration is required. Visit the library's website to reserve your spot. Inebriart's Art on the Green has become a Plymouth tradition and returns for its fourth year on Saturday, April 1st. From 11 a.m. to 4 p.m., head over to the Plymouth Town Hall Green and browse the work of local artists who will have their work in mediums including ceramics, painting, sculpture, and more on display and available for purchase. This popular event grows bigger every year. Inebriart has partnered with the Spire Center for Performing Arts this year to offer even more. This event is free and open to the public. For more information, visit inebriart.com. In our endlessly connected and distracted world, finding ways to improve concentration and focus is important to our well-being. Crafting is one approach that has numerous benefits beyond the finished product. With this in mind, the Pembroke Public Library is offering a teen take and make craft kit. 
Starting April 1st and while supplies last, teens can pick up a cotton candy craft kit to take home and work on in your own unrushed time. No registration is needed. Visit the Young Adult Lounge to pick up your project materials. Head to the movies the way they were seen over 100 years ago at the Duxbury Senior Center showing of the 1927 silent film My Best Girl, starring America's sweetheart Mary Pickford and her future husband Buddy Rogers. The movie captures the romantic energy of these two well-known actors as they fell in love on film just as their characters did. This silent film will be supplemented with a beautiful piano accompaniment by Richard Hughes to transport you into the silent film era movie buff experience. My Best Girl shows at the center on April 4th at 1.30 p.m. Visit DuxburySeniorCenter.org to register. What do Big Bird, Elmo, and Ted love about the night sky? Come to the Blake Planetarium's Night Out for our youngest learners on April 4th to find out. Beginning at 6.30 p.m., two preschool and early elementary programs will portray the awe and wonder of our solar system, all in little friendly language and imagery. Ted's Space Adventure seeks the perfect planet for Ted's plant, which of course needs water and sunshine, but can't be too warm or too cold. In One World, One Sky, Sesame Street's Big Bird and Elmo take an imaginary trip from Sesame Street to the moon with Hu Hu Zhu, a character from the Chinese co-production of the beloved show. Together they learn how different the moon is from our Earth. Tickets are available online only through the Planetarium's Eventbrite page. All ages are welcome and parking is free. Can you really believe your own eyes? If you're a fan of magic and prestidigitation, then you're sure to be amazed and entertained on Saturday, March 25th, when master illusionist Lynn Dillies visits the Spire Center in Plymouth. One of the most highly acclaimed female illusionists in America, Lynn will astound you with her masterful and mind-blowing illusions. Get your tickets through spirecenter.org. One of our local harbingers of spring is the Easter Egg Hunt on the Green, hosted by Old Colony YMCA in Red Brook. On April 1st at 1 p.m., join the Plymouth Y for a fun and family-friendly egg hunt. Visit and pictures with the one and only Easter Bunny himself, games, crafts, and lots more. The cost is only $20 per family for non-members of the YMCA. You can register for the event through the Easter Egg Hunt's Eventbrite page. Between 1865 and 1898, America experienced the Gilded Age, a time of economic expansion when material excess, wealth, and glamour existed alongside a vast disparity of wealth between the social classes. On March 25th, learn more at the Duxbury Rural and Historical Society's 2023 Symposium, Beyond the Bustle, Uncovering the Gilded Age. Examining lesser-known history of the time period, the five symposium speakers will go beyond the glamour, high finance, and politics of the time to tell fascinating stories and examine some lesser-known history. The event will take place in the Merry Room of the Duxbury Free Library, and the Historical Society is partnering with the Foodsmith to offer box lunch options for the day. Visit DuxburyHistory.org for information about the event, the speakers, and to get your tickets. And that's what's good and good to know on the local scene this week. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next time.
Thank you for watching. We are grateful for your attention. If you like what you saw, please like and subscribe to The Local Scene here and share everywhere. Thank you, friends.